Welcome back to the Real News Network. I'm talking to Robert McChesney and John Nichols about their new book, People Get Ready. John, good to have you back. Robert, good, good to have you. It's our back. pleasure to be yes. here again. So let's uh, talk about the political moment we are in and uh, the mobilization that Bernie Sanders in particular has been able to do in this country in a way that we have not seen in a very long time. And, uh, and it's about real issues. It's about what you're talking about in the book, um, economy, joblessness, and young people getting uh, motivated and mobilized behind those issues. And one could argue that that is perhaps a result of uh, uh, Occupy Wall Street and the kind of consciousness that it generated among the youth. Uh, but uh, let me start with you, Robert. Um, give us a description of what these young people are facing and in terms of what is at stake in this particular election. You know, I think the place to start is that this, the, a great news story that's been missed, I think, almost entirely in the mainstream corporate NPR world is this incredible support for Bernie Sanders among young people. I mean, John and I have talked about this and looked into it. To my knowledge, there's no other candidate who's drawn these sort of percentages of people under 30 in an election in American history in a contested race. I mean, if you're unopposed, possibly, but in a contested race. The numbers are simply staggering. Over 80% of people under 30, and it extends upward. It's usually 55, 60%, as high as 45, even 50. Uh, you know, he's getting younger voters, especially under 30 as never before. And you sort of, why could this be? What's going on? And, you know, Bernie Sanders isn't very, you know, he hasn't traditionally been regarded as one of the great charismatic figures of, the, of our times. He has a certain amount of appeal. He has an authenticity which certainly connects with people. Uh, and he has certain strong values which connects with people. But there have been other politicians who've had that in the past. They've never gotten this sort of youth support. And I think, you know, the issue is that we're in a fundamental structural change that's going on in this country that is making politics relevant to young people in a way they haven't been. You know, most young people don't vote. They don't care about politics. And it's not that they, they don't care about politics per se. What they don't care about is establishment politics, which is what America's had for the last 40 years, which is politicians say whatever BS they need to say to get elected. Then once in office, they shut the door and they do whatever their funders and their friends and their cronies want them to do. Then they heat up a focus group and cook up some more spin for the next election. And young people, I think, rightfully have seen this election after election and realized it's a lot of BS. It's like, why should I invest time in this? So Sanders' appeal, as he comes along, he's clearly not that. You don't call yourself a democratic socialist after doing a focus group in 1980 uh, that if you want to have a successful political career. He, he stands for something, he believes it, but he's also a person at this right point in history, and the point in history is this. Uh, our economy is now stagnant. Capitalism is low. Is, every decade has had slower growth in terms of the number of fast-growing quarters since the 50s, and it's really just dead in the water right now, the private economy, $2 trillion uninvested. It's not changing. Unemployment and underemployment is the great story uh, of our economy. The number of people in the labor force is plummeting among young people, men and women, uh, in the last 10 years. No sign that this is going to change. And I think what's happening is young people, when things get bad enough, Young people take politics seriously because they understand the political solutions. And here comes along someone who's identifying a problem and saying, I'm going to solve it, and who has a record of not being a traditional establishment BS artist politician. So I think that accounts for his rise. And I think it's something in the book we structurally explain, but we didn't anticipate it to take place this quickly. We said it's going to be clear that with the crisis we're entering with unemployment and underemployment, the government's going to have to play a much larger role. Everyone gets that. It's just what sort of roles it can play to create jobs, to encourage employment, to sort of make our transition into wherever we're going with the new technologies. And uh, it will be a movement that will undoubtedly call into question capitalism since the system's failing. So it will be a democratic socialist movement and it will be young people. So we anticipate that, just not this quickly. The other side of the coin, though, is that we equally anticipate that as the center collapses, as the establishment politics are seen as increasingly corrupt and incompetent and worthless and, and mendacious, that they will shrink in their importance. And But not everyone will go to the Democratic left. Elites will try to defend their uh, privileges. And you'll see the rise of what is called fascism. 
And when John and I initially put this in the book, our editor looked at it and said, you know, hmm. this, this is like last year. She goes, you know, you can't use a term like fascism in the book for America. You know, that, that's not going to work. You know, that's, that was like back in the 40s. And we said, no, this is where the evidence is pointing. When you have this sort of environment, it leads to fascist movements everywhere, including the United States. And then along comes Donald Trump, uh, which is I'm not saying Donald Trump is a fascist per se, but the way his campaign has evolved, uh, the way it's supported, has is a classic example of a fascist political movement. So I think, in a sense, our book tries lays out explains the great insecurity young people feel that lead them to progressive and democratic solutions and the great anxiety that other workers of working class and lower middle class people feel, uh, who feel really powerless, generally older than Bernie supporters, that lead them to some sort of solution, anything, a strong man, just to kick some butt, because what's been happening for the last 20 years has been bad for them, and it looks like it's gonna get a lot worse. Right, so John, talk about the youth, the unemployment rates they're facing, the political moment they're engaged in, and we're talking about various ways in which we could be involved in uh, economic democracy in this country, and I think that moment is here, and particularly with Bernie. Uh, so give us a sense of what the youth are actually facing and uh, uh, what this political moment means for them. Well, you're right, my friend. The moment is here. In fact, it probably arrived about five years ago, in 2011, when we saw the Occupy movement began, begin to take off. And you know, I often hear people say that Occupy didn't work or that it didn't succeed. And I so disagree with that. I, th I think that's a ridiculous concept. I think Occupy has been massively successful and continues to be. It's just that when we, so many people look at politics in such narrow ways that they presume it will only play out you know, on one model. And what I would suggest to you is this, that since 2011, really since 2008, a couple years later with the meltdown of the global economy, the meltdown of our domestic stock market, rise of massive unemployment, we had something happen which is very little discussed in our media. And that is that we wiped out savings for a lot of people in their 50s and 60s who had expected to retire, you know, at a reasonable age. They all ended up working longer. Right? Tremendous numbers of people just has to make up with what had been lost because our response to an economic crisis was not to help those who were hardest hit. Our response was to redistribute wealth upwards, to give money to the banks. Everybody saw that happen. But what people didn't notice was that because all those folks worked longer, right, didn't retire, had to try to make up what they had lost, the entry points for younger people became narrower and narrower. Now, some young folks in this country have been in a, you know, something akin to depression for a long time economically. You know, we have communities, urban communities, some communities of color, low-income white folks from some rural areas who the opportunities have always been narrow, too narrow for a civil society. But after that 2008 play out, then you started to see middle-class kids from all sorts of backgrounds not seeing that road up. So here they are taking on massive college debt to have an opportunity and the road up isn't there in part because of what we just discussed there, and also in part, of the things, in part because of the things we're talking about in our book. We are increasingly moving toward an economy where digital changes and the expanse of automation create fewer jobs. Just there are fewer things for people to do. So I think it's not surprising at all that millions and millions of young people have become engaged, not just in electoral politics, but also the rise of a $15 in a union movement, the rise of a movement, especially on the West Coast, for a retail workers' bill of rights to get you know, some sort of sense of what our hours might be at the very least and how and where we work. The rise of a Black Lives Matter movement that says, you know, look, this is ridiculous. And Black Lives Matter, you know, it's, they, they see the absurdity of criminal justice system that works the way it does. They see the, the horror of policing that works the way it does. The Black Lives Matter movement in this country has been very sophisticated. It also sees economics. It sees the mass unemployment uh, and all sorts of other issues that, that feed into this. And so we have these sophisticated movements that have come up, and I would add in the immigrant rights movement. Again, something driven a lot by younger folks, uh, young workers, students, dreamers. And so we have all these movements that have begun to develop up. We should not be surprised at all that uh, many of them are now playing it out politically. They aren't all playing it out politically and electorally in the same way, but a lot of them, a lot of folks have ended up in supportive of a Bernie Sanders candidacy. What is it about Sanders? I would suggest it's a very simple thing. 
And, 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 and this, you know, it, it, we would love it to be so complicated and all that. Uh, I would suggest Bernie Sanders is imperfect. He's made mistakes. He's a flawed guy. He hasn't always spoken up on every issue that you'd want him to speak up on and hasn't done it as well as he should. However, there's kind of a sense that on balance, he'll try. You know, he, he defaults to trying to, to get to the issues that people care about. And the sense that what drives him is a, some sort of passion for economic and social justice. That alone is a big deal. I, I think that's important. But it's also two things that he says. Number one, he says he's a democratic socialist. When we have all of these challenges with our economy, but also with challenges in our social lives, in our, in our education systems, in our communities, you know, it seems to a lot of young people, I think, that just capitalism as it's been set up isn't working all that well. So alternative ideas suddenly are far more attractive than they used to be. And if you want to say you're anti-establishment at a time where we're looking for anti-establishment, that's a pretty good start. Now, at least a pretty good start of describing an alternative. The other thing he says is to get out of this, it's not easy. Politicians love to tell us that the fix is easy. This guy says it's going to be a political revolution. The only way you get there is with great big wampum changes. Well, some older folks, and I understand, are a little bit unsettled by that. But I think an awful lot of young people looking at their economic, social, cultural circumstances, the things, the burdens that are being put on them, say, yeah, a little bit of political revolution sounds like a pretty good idea. So I don't think it's that hard to understand, you know, why some of this has happened. The only counsel I'd give is don't see it in isolation. Don't see, don't, don't just get wrapped up in the guy or in the political moment. Understand there are streams coming into this, economic patterns coming in, and also understand that there's a future. And an awful lot of these young folks, I think are doing a much better job than, than the rest of us perhaps, at looking at that future and saying, it's unsettling, it's at times unnerving, I'm not sure you know, how it fits together, and at the very least, well, I don't, want, I don't expect somebody to give me all the answers, I want somebody to be in the center of that, who is, if we're gonna cede power to an individual or to a group of individuals, I'd like those folks to be caring about me rather than the billionaires and the CEOs who seem to have so much power. So I think it's a very logical moment that we're in. Uh, the only thing I can't tell you, because I can explain all these things, I can't tell you exactly where we're going. And I don't think anybody knows. We are in the most volatile political year in modern American history. And those who tell you that something's ended or something's finished or something's possible or something is impossible, I would invite them to sit back and pause for a moment because we started this 2016 race presuming that it was going to be a contest between Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. Thought everything, every, every rule was in, everything was written, the future was all finished. But well, we're obviously not there right now. I don't know where we're going to end up, but what I can tell you is I really think that these young people jumping into this thing are a huge part of what has opened up a process that desperately needed to be opened up. So I think it's pretty healthy what's going on, at least on that side of it. The other side, I can see some things that frighten me a bit, but boy, you know, our biggest crisis in America has been low voter turnout, has been so many people feeling so dispossessed that they don't engage. Uh, if we see, if we bring masses of young people into this process, that is the single best way to fix every problem we've got. That just, that level of engagement, that level of involvement, you give me that and I will feel dramatically calmer about our future than I do if they're not there. Bob, um, the impact, uh, this digital revolution and the uh, unemployment you're talking about, um, the impact this is going to have on young people, what are the numbers? Well, the numbers are, as John just said, and I think you've mentioned, the unemployment rates are already low uh, or high, uh, very high, uh, historically high across the board, depending on ethnic group, race and gender. Uh, they're just astronomical. And there's no reason those will get lower. I mean, so we're talking about 30, 40, 50 percent rates of unemployment uh, among high school uh, graduates. Um, and, you know, you see it in a number of different measures. I mean, just the number of kids now who have to live with their parents deep into their 20s or even their 30s, something that when I was, came out of college or and was working in the 70s, that almost never happened. Uh, I mean, you didn't, you, couldn't, you didn't have to pay debt uh, to go to college. The tuitions were very low, almost free when I was going to college. 
And, you know, you, if you had a job, you had enough money to pay your rent. You could actually live somewhere, maybe even save money. That was a natural expectation. And if you, just, and if you lost a job, you could find there was another one. job. I mean, to put it in yeah, context. there was options. When I, when I went to look for my first job out of college as a phone solicitor, which was a horrible job, but my second job out of college, I got a job in a lumberyard. And it was a union job. That was back when those jobs were unionized. And uh, all the people I worked with were guys who did it for a career. And it paid roughly, once you were there this certain amount of time, 10 bucks an hour. It translates into roughly $75,000, $80,000 mm -hmm. in current dollars that I got then. Just walking in off the street, you didn't even have to have a high school degree to do that job, although I think they wanted you to have one. And, you know, that job, I thought it was a good job, and I was glad I had it, but I didn't stay there that long. I found something better a few months later. But my students I have today, my daughter, her friends, you said, hey, here's a job you can get for seventy five or $80,000. I mean, they would be willing to sacrifice their firstborn. I mean, that, that's like winning the lottery. Uh, it's, the world is so different uh, that they face from what we face. And then we haven't even talked about the issue you have to layer on top of this, which is the environmental crisis, which really, really ex exaggerates all these problems and makes them worse too. So you put that in on it. Uh, the need for the government to do something proactively to address these problems uh, is so enormous now, I think it really says we have to get involved in politics. We have to do something or we're going to lose our generation, our species. All right, gentlemen, let's continue our discussion in our next segment on the same topic. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.